our final, our final author this morning is the New York Times best-selling author of 22 novels. There are currently over 30 million copies of her works in print, which are published in over 35 countries. All of these countries have over 200 towns and cities, in each of which you will find anywhere from 5 to 25 million people. That last part is not strictly relevant, but interesting. Her new book, Betrayed, a Rosado and Associates novel, comes out November 25th. Please welcome Lisa Scottolini. Well, welcome to my own personal nightmare. Let me take you inside my head right now. Right? Do I want to shoot myself right now to follow this group? I mean, there is no better panel I've ever heard, been on, been around the tri-state area. We have heard about a young man choosing his own adventure, and God did he. We have heard about a wonderful artist, an amazing artist with an incredible life story. From Castles in Galway to your upbringing, a great thinker, a great orator, uh, also, in, add into this personal nightmare that you're going to close this speech, and not only that, they're going to magnify your face, <laughs> and you're middle-aged. <laughs> your blow-dry is flopping. Excuse me. So much better, right? Yeah! Oh, my God. Well... However, I take so much, so much inspiration from this panel because I said to myself, what the hell are you going to do? That's not really what I said. I cleaned it up. <laughs> but I really thought of what I wanted to say, and it was inspired by all of you. So if I do this speech right, I'm going to start small, bring it bigger, synthesize it everything they said and give you a larger message which is going to take you into the rest of BEA inspired, elevated, with a smile on your face. Can I do it? Watch me. Watch me. <laughs> First, thank you. Thank you to BEA, to ABA, to every acronym I can think of, to all of the booksellers here. To all of the librarians, woo, 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 woo. <laughs> to my beloved publisher, I love them. To my amazing daughter and best friend who are here, Francesca, Laura. Wow, this is a big gig. It matters. Let me tell you why I think it matters. People say, where do you get your ideas? Let me tell you a story. Sometimes they come from life, a memory. What if? Here's a memory. I'm walking down a street in South Philly, which is the Italian-American ghetto of Philadelphia. The food is excellent, however. And um, <laughs> I'm about seven, and I'm walking with my mom, and we see a car pull up to the curb. And the curb, it stops at the light, and it's a big pink car that is delicious and vo it's voluptuous the way cars used to be and and fins and breasts and everything about this car is sexy and the woman at the wheel is very sexy and I'm thinking a little Pritzy's vibe because she is majorly dark hair and black black eyebrows and red red lips and this is like a face you will never forget even at my age which we can discuss later and um the car stops and my mother looks at the driver, and the driver looks at her, and the driver makes this face. It's like Italian kabuki. It's like, ah! And my mother's like, oh, watch this. Watch this. So my mother walks over to the driver, and all of a sudden, the driver cranks the window up in my mother's face, and my mother starts laughing, and then she comes back to the curb. And I say to my mother, who was that? And she says, that was my sister. <laughs> My mother was one of 19, right? We were excellent Catholics back then. <laughs> now we're not only lapsed, we're collapsed. But in any event, she, I knew all of my aunts and uncles. I mean, they were at our house on Sunday. And I sort of said to her, like, what do you mean? How can there be an aunt in my family who I don't know? Because in my family, 
the blood and the tomato sauce, they're very thick. And she says, that's your Aunt Lena, and we haven't spoken in 17 and a half years. And I say, why is that? This is where you're going to be really impressed by me, because she says, uh, well, we don't speak to her because she brought a gun to a wedding. I know, it's that kind of family. Just pretend like I'm Amy Tan and don't have these kind of stories to tell, okay? So I'm like, this is amazing, and this is kind of weird. And at some point in midlife, which for me was like 35 years ago, I go, wonder what that was with Aunt Lena. And I decide that I want to understand that. And so I talk to my mom, and I go, what do you mean she you brought a gun to a wedding? Because really, this is a family that is not necessarily highbrow and weapons, offenses, we kind of minor in it. So I'm like, since when is that such a big damn deal? And she's, no, you gotta ask the rest of the family, they know the story better than I do. So I talk to these uncles and I talk to these aunts and they're all 80 something and 90 something, sadly they've all passed, as has my mother last month. And I say to them, why did we not speak to Aunt Lena? Because we don't kick people out of our family for dumb stuff. And they say, well, part of the people think that, they, that she brought the gun to a wedding, and part of the family thinks that she brought the gun to a Holy Communion, and they see this as a difference, which the only difference is like, you know, I mean, maybe the, the bar doesn't open at the communion until like maybe four. <laughs> it's, still, it's still a cash bar. I mean, come on. This is a family where you don't leave your purse at the table when you dance. You, it's just not impressive. It's not impressive. So what I realized in talking to these people in that your task in understanding something that is true is nothing you will learn from your family, though you will try. And what I could see in these people was that they were 80-something and they all had been raised in Italy and even if they hadn't, they came here and they brought it and it was a mindset. And the mindset was that we don't like authority, we don't like law, but interestingly, in the absence of law, we make law. And in the laws we make, if you do something that we regard so antisocial as to bring a loaded weapon into a place where there's cheap booze, <laughs> we, are going to, we are going to make a law, and the law of the Flying Scottolini is that we will ostracize you from the family. We will never speak to you again. You're dead to us. Like, that's real. And I said, it's so interesting to me, as a former lawyer, I, I didn't lead with that because I wanted you to like me, that, <laughs> that really, in the absence of law, people make it. They make a code of conduct. It's about what is justice and what is truth. And I said, that's a novel. That can be a novel. It became the vendetta defense, story of a young American lawyer who is going to try to defend somebody who committed a killing but doesn't think it was a murder. The emotional truth of that novel came from Aunt Lena. Another quick story, a somewhat more relatable story because I'm sure your families are much better behaved than mine. Here I am, we're the people in the room who have packed up a kid from college, right? We, we exist, right? You go, you pick up your kid. My daughter went to school in Boston. I went to pick her up for the last time. She's graduated, she's coming home. We pack the car. The car is full to the gills. Shoes, books, God bless her. Shoes and shoes, also earrings. DVDs, Sex in the City. I see the parents of boys, they have a basketball. <laughs> it's all right, I love my kid. We get in the car, the car is packed. We put the box spring on top. We put a mattress on top. And on top of those things, she wants me to keep a rug. It is a cheap-ass red rug. That's a term of art. It costs $37, but she wants to save it. I cannot deny my kid anything, and it's, all right, we'll do it. We strap it on the, box, the top of the thing. We do the whole bungee cord. All the single moms, everybody knows the bungee cord thing, right? They never work. They're weird, but you do it. We leave Boston for Philadelphia by Connecticut, the worst rainstorm ever. Right? The mother of all rainstorms. Of course, it's in some place like Greenwich. I'm like, great. <laughs> and people are pointing and laughing because what is happening is that the red rug is bleeding <laughs> all over my beautiful white car. It is a, it's like a blood mobile. It's like, I don't know what color plasma is, but I think it's like a cheap red color. 
and we're driving and people are pointing and laughing. And at that point, we look at each other and we just start to laugh. And we basically laugh through the next three states. And somewhere on that, I get sad, secretly sad. I didn't let it show. But I had that moment thinking, I am not going to have many great car rides with my kid anymore because she's going to grow up. <laughs> she stopped nursing already, which is so frigging annoying. And, <laughs> and how, how do I let her go? You know, there's a joke, and it's about Italian mothers, and it's what is the difference between an Italian mother and a Rottweiler? And the answer is eventually the Rottweiler lets go. <laughs> what can I tell you? I think it's about all mothers. I think it's about all good parents. It's hard to let them go. And I was sad. And when we got home, for something that happened, I somehow reached the threshold of my house. And I thought a second. I said, you know, you are really, you are thinking about this the wrong way. It isn't a question of whether you let her go, because that assumes you own her. Somehow she is your possession that you, you, you release. This is not true. That's not a mom and a daughter. That's not any parent, any child. You get to be with them for a while, and they go and fly. And as soon as I had that thought, I said, I feel better. Like, I, my heart lifted, and I said, that's a novel. Where do you get your ideas from a moment like that? I took that truth, and I wrote a book called Look Again, which was chosen for World Book Night, so amazingly and happily. And it's about a woman, oh, wait, let me get this straight. She's a single mother with fake blonde hair. <laughs> Come on, are we surprised? <laughs> she lives outside of Philadelphia, and she has a kid. And what happens is, it's an adopted kid. And so one day she comes home, and in her mail is a card. And it's from one of those missing and adoptive children things. And there's pictures of children. Have you seen this child? And she looks at the middle picture, and that is her child, an adopted child. And readers know, because God bless us, readers are smart. And readers know, as soon as they see that, that something's wrong with this woman's adoption, unbeknownst to her. And she is going to have that great dilemma that she's going to solve in that book, which is, do I say nothing and get to keep my child? Or do I tell the truth and lose my child? The novel began because of that red rug. The emotional truth of that novel is something completely different. When you are a novelist, and I'm trying mightily to be one after 20 odd novels and nonfiction, the interesting thing you learn is that you have to tell it true. My guidance always comes from Francis Coppola, whom I never met, although the great love of my life is also Jack Nicholson. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell! <laughs> I love what Francis Coppola said. He said, nothing in my movies, nothing in my movies ever happened but all of it is true. Everybody who writes, all of us who write, whether it's memoir or fiction, I have learned from writing these memoirs with my daughter, which happily have been compared to Irma Bombeck. Please tell me you know who that is, by the way. <laughs> right? Well, even if it's funny, it has to be true. It has to make me a little worried about saying it out loud. I have to become an open book. If it's going to be a, even the smallest point, for example, in these book, what we say, uh, I tell about the time that I found my first chin hair that was gray, and I realized I was turning into an Amish man <laughs> before my own eyes. Now, <laughs> do you know why? May I just tell you that, suggest to you rather, that the reason that's funny is because it's kind of true. Like, you know you plucked for this thing. I did, and happily you can tell. <laughs> so when you're in your, you know, when you're in the mirror, just think of me every time. Do this in memory of me. <laughs> Sorry. What I am saying is this. 
You have heard some amazing stories today, life stories. Not only their life stories, but Dr. King's life stories, Maya Angelou's life stories, John Huston's life stories, her amazing mother's life stories, and the life story of this adorable little boy. And still, I love you so much. And I love Doogie Howser. I do, I do. But the point is this. Sometimes it's literally true. Sometimes emotionally it's true. It has to be true. Why? The really hard question is why. And I will tell you what I think. I taught it to myself. I don't know if this is true, but test it. Because you guys are all smart. You'll figure this out. Let me know. I think it matters that it's true because it only connects if it's true. And I think about that because I know it from my lawyer days, that you cannot stand up in front of a jury and sell something you do not believe. Yep. You can't look somebody in the eye, you can't fake it, you can't even convince yourself it's true and try to sell it, which is the story of my second marriage. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. You have, it has to be true. I love that phrase, truth has a ring. Truth has a ring. You hear it. You know when someone's lying to you, don't you? If you're not married to them and you're smarter than me, you know that's not where he was. <laughs> truth matters because it connects people one to the other. And the great thing about the arts, but specifically about books, because that's all I know about, right? I have a life in books. I'm privileged to have a life in books. I'm lucky to have a life in books. And why books do is if I write something really true, like true and almost a little embarrassing, the kind of thing that makes your mouth a little dry in front of a thousand people, just hypothetical, just hypothetical. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Now you know I'm divorced twice. <clears throat> if I write something that is really, really true, you will know it, and you will start to find things in your life that are that. Even though you're not Italian, even though you're not from South Philly, even though you don't fake your hair color, or wear a ridiculously pretentious bra just to impress people who don't care. The truth matters, and the, when you have the truth, and it really is true, it the, connects people one to the other. And the proof of this, may I suggest to you, is book clubs. Who here is in a book club? Woohoo! Right? Who's here? Who here is in more than one? Right? People are in many book clubs. People are in book clubs of 10 years standing, 20 years standing. 30 years standing. I know this because I go to the book club sometimes and I have them at my house every year. And the truth is, every book club discussion goes the same way. You know, they begin the discussion with the first five minutes about my book. And then the next 45 minutes are about what? My hair, my dogs, my cholesterol, my cellulite, my grandkids, my kids. And I will tell you what happens at every book club meeting. Invariably, somebody will look up at me and go, we're really sorry. We're supposed to be talking about your book. And I say the same thing every time, which is true. And it is. But you are talking about my book. If I write something that's true about how heartbreaking it is to have your kid grow up, and also how glorious it is to have your kid grow up. It will touch something in you, and when you start to talk about your favorite part of a book, you're talking about yourself. When you start to talk about what Maya Angelou means to you, you're talking about her, but she resonates because it's about you. And books become a very intimate thing. They become a soul-to-soul -soul connection. I actually think of the Dr. King quote, because I always think it goes to, somehow, when you read a book and you feel our words, or the words of any author, alive or dead, Maya Angelou will never really die. You feel their soul and you connect that way. And that's why book clubs grow and grow and grow and why we seek each other out in book clubs because we want to share that. We are all of us engaged in that endeavor of making the books and reading the books and selling the books and borrowing the books and promoting the books. And God bless us, how lucky are we? I think there's 
I, as I mentioned, I lost my mother. We all know that life is short. Everybody says it. And I thought Tavis was so great in sort of getting past the platitudes of things. Life is short is a platitude. But I will tell you, I sat at my mother's bedside and I held her hand. I held her hand as her body left this earth. And I think that if you remember that and have that with you, then you know how very lucky you are in the few years we have on this earth to be engaged in what we do. Because I must tell you my personal view is that while it is bought and sold, and there's lots of meetings and conferences about what the business of books and book scan and the numbers and the ebook digital and all that minutia that make up the life of book people. We are engaged in a business and we're not so stupid that we don't know that. However, it is not peanut butter, folks. It ain't a pair of sneakers. Sneakers are more expensive. <laughs> it is something else. And I can tell you that as an author of 20 years standing, because there is not a day that goes by that I don't get an email from somebody who says, you know those funny books you write with your daughter? That got me through chemo. Or a day that goes by when somebody goes, I was in the hospital and I read this and I lost myself in your book. I couldn't put it down because I was transported and that got me through my divorce, my this, my that, my cholesterol, my hair, my carbohydrates, everything. Your truth was a truth that somehow got me through something and that's what books do. That's what's magic about them and that's why we all of us in this room, everyone up here, but all of you too equally are are so privileged to, be, to buy and sell them and write them and do whatever we do. There are many ways to live your life on this earth and there's lots of ways to earn a living. This is a special, special one. I feel so lucky to be a part of it. I feel so lucky to have met you all and listened to you. I feel so lucky for the librarians I met and listened to yesterday. I am lucky in all of you. And please let me suggest that we are lucky in all of us. Thank you.